Hi, South by Southwest, how are you doing? Too kind. Uh, I'm here today joined by uh, Joey Ito, the director of the Media Lab, and Tim Brown, CEO of IDEO. My name is Colin Rainey. I'm a designer at IDEO, and I also sit on the advisory council at the MIT Media Lab. Today, we'd like to talk about a blank slide. <laughs> How we will make things in the future, which is a small sentence that asks a lot of huge questions because how we make things infers the needs we have, the cultures we live in, the education we have received, and the technology that we've used to make these tools. And that's why this is interesting because, like it or not, in the future, technology will continue to evolve. It's sort of 50-50 good or bad what that technology will do for us, and it's up to us to design it to do something amazing, I believe. Um, so as we develop this technology, we use it to solve problems. We ultimately create our tools, and as we create that, our tools, we create the future. We shape what we need. So to kind of bastardize an old quote, how we will shape technology, it's a question, sorry, how will we shape technology and how will it shape us? And so that's why we're really lucky today to have two of the foremost thinkers of design, people's needs, which is Tim Brown, and technology, which is Joey from the Media Lab, to talk about how, as we compare the needs that we have and the technologies we have, and it takes us forward, how it will shape our future. So at IDEO recently, we've launched a, a website. It's called madeinthefuture.co. Um, and we've used some of, the, some of the explorations of technology at the Media Lab as inspiration for some of our design, exp design experiments. We have a site that you can check out, but this is a trailer to kind of give you a feel for the mood, and we'll be playing some of those as we play um, the lab work through the day. And there's audio. So we've been wondering how we'll make things in the future. Sure, lots of things are created for us, but making still makes us human. It helps us express ideas, learn new skills, and create community. But technology is changing the way we make things, and this is about understanding how that technology could shape our future. As we explored this, we discovered five themes, and we started to see glimpses of really exciting things. New tools will develop, new ways we'll learn, and even new economies we might create. We hope you like it. Made in the future. So, it's kind of fun. So the, the key thing here is it's learning by doing. You, you, you have no idea what the future will bring. You have no idea what this technology will do. Um, so you start to play with it. This happens a lot at the Media Lab and a lot at IDEO. We want to work through three uh, lenses or themes. Um, how our tools will become smarter, how we'll start to sense new things, and as that adaptivity, as we can sense these things, we can make things adaptive. And then we'll talk about how this wor stuff works at scale through new manufacture. So let's start with smarter tools. Um, you know, our tools are becoming more intelligent, and they're beginning to anticipate, and react, and evolve, and actually even teach us. So what does that mean? Let's show you a piece of work from the Media Lab. The Luminar is, an, uh, is a robotic, responsive robotic arm that works with a projector and a camera. And as Natan is moving around the image with his finger, it's responding. Natan also founded Form Labs. He's, he's a pretty sharp guy. So what you'll see now is he'll take a book, lay it down, press a place on the screen that's sort of a button. It will take a photo. And then he'll start to annotate that text. So it's a completely fluid interface that appears on any surface that's flat enough to, to render the image. So we thought, well, what, what does that look like um, you know, to help people learn in new ways or to express your creativity? This is Alexis. She's sitting at what we're calling iteration table. It's a new way of drawing and getting what's in your head out. She's drawing on a special pad. It looks like a dinosaur and it's great. But she's not quite happy with the arm yet. She highlights the section and gets 15 iterations all drawn in her style. So she picks out her favorite and then blends it with her drawing. It's not really about the computer doing the work for you. It's about using the computer as an extension of your brain. And with systems like this, Alexis can accelerate her exploration, increase her confidence, and turbocharge her creativity. So this sort of, these new tools ask all kinds of interesting questions, I think. I'd love for you guys to, what, 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 what does this space make you think about? <clears throat> this is where we get to say something? Yeah, you should. All right, great, cool. 
I, mean, I thought you were going to do all the work. No, but I you're we here. Were just going to set I mean, up like here should, and enjoy the view of all of this great audience sat in front. Oh, damn. Oh well. Okay. We'll, uh, you know, I, and I, I, I think there are there are lots of ways you can kind of interpret this kind of uh, this kinds of technology, and you certainly could interpret it as taking away people's creativity, right? But uh, what you know, what I've noticed, I think what we've noticed with the work that we do is that um, there's this barrier that prevents many people from just trying things. And if we can lower that barrier, if we can, if we can make it easy for people to explore, particularly explore choices, there's something about our, uh, our education system which, which, which encourages to think in a very convergent way, right? It, it encourages to think about the solution, the answer, get to it as fast as possible, and then move forward, which is useful in some circumstances. But when it comes to innovation and creativity, it's all about divergent thinking. It's all about how many choices can we make. So, I mean, the iteration table is a very simple and obvious version of that, right? It's like, what happens if you put lots more choices in front of people or make it easier for people to explore choices? Um, but also, I, I, in a way, I think Luminar is doing the same thing because it's, it's allowing you very fluidly to move between one medium to another, uh, and another, which makes it easier to explore things. And so technology that doesn't get in the way, but instead, uh, kind of opens up possi possibilities for exploration. Feels to me like it's going to encourage creativity. And, and I'm going to just do some terminology definition. I mean, some people say left brain, right brain. Some Kahneman says S1, S2. But there's a part of your brain that's pattern recognition, intuitive, fuzzy. There's a part of your brain that's linear, logical, symbolic. And most of our user interfaces for our technology especially digital technology, focuses on what you're paying attention to, like commands, okay, I'm gonna, and even when you're talking to Siri, it's Siri, blah, 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 right? So, so that's your, Kahneman to say S2, that's the logical part of your brain. And some people, again, this is, this is arguable, I'm not arguing this, but it's just one way to think about it, that, that art, pure art, is channeling the pure creative side of your, your brain. And design, which is what you do, actually engages more of the symbolic side and pulls on the creative side, but it's not channeling the creative side. So, so design is creative, but it also engages the symbolic side. Whereas pure art, that's, and again, this is a theory, some people would say the tool has to disappear. It has to allow the purely creative side to express. So basically, if, you're, if you had to sit there and think about your brush while you painted, you wouldn't be able to create art. And again, this is a theory. But, but when you tie it into interface, what's kind of interesting to think about is how can you make the thinking, it's like meditation, right? Meditation is the not thinking. And so how do you get that to go away when you're doing design is an important part of encouraging creativity. And I think a lot of interface design is how do you interact with the logical part of the person. But when we start to look at things like peripheral vision and pattern recognition and the soft emotional side, I think that's another piece, which in these two examples, it wasn't really necessarily there. But, and, and, then, and then this affects education, because education is about testing. Mm -hmm. Did you learn the thing? Do you have the skill? But a lot of mastery is, do you have the confidence? Right. Do you have the creativity? Are you passionate? Are you inspired? And education today doesn't test for that. Mm -hmm. And so my real fear, even with all these online courses, is if you don't do it properly, you're just pumping and amping this knowledge, skill side of your brain, which doesn't necessarily help with the, with the creativity. And in fact, the logical side of your brain, even though some people think it's smart, it's actually not very good at things like drawing. No, it gets, and, in, and it, it gets in the way. Yeah, yeah it gets in the and, way. And if, I mean, although you're right about design being a kind of interface between, mm -hmm. in the moments when you're trying to express yourself as a designer, which is normally when you, if you're drawing something, you're exploring a form or you're, uh, th that needs to come from, it needs to, it's a physical, it's a physical process. And so you, the, the same need to remove the tool, mm -hmm. remove, or at least remove consciousness of the tool, get into flow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and we don't build too many interfaces today that allow people to get to flow. Especially and, digital stuff. Right, exactly. And so I, I think that's what these guys were trying to, trying to get to. That's cool. All right. <clears throat> so we'll move on to sensing. And, uh, you know, commercial sensing has gotten really hot really fast. So two years ago, the Nike Fuel Band was introduced here. I mean, there are a lot of other, you know, consumer sensors, but the, the amount that we're starting to wear that will track our vital signs is, is crazy. Um, but we're moving, you know, especially in the research area, moving beyond vitals really quickly. Uh, one, of the, one of the more fascinating parts of the lab, Media Lab, and there are many, is the effective computing group. They're actually uh, learning how with conductive skin technology to sort of track um, your emotional responses. 
it's a part of, I have to write it down because I always forget it, it's the sympathetic nervous system. So it's not the circulatory system. Your vitals, you know, if your heart rate goes up, that's a circulatory system. It's a lagging indicator. But the effective computing group is actually dealing with a part of the nervous system that's a little bit deeper, so it can track things. Um, this, this guy is an autistic child. He's, he has autism, sorry. And he's putting together Legos. And every time this graph kicks up, he's getting stressed out. So he's looking at the instructions, and then he's trying to find the piece. And because he has problems sort of uh, navigating these things, he gets really stressed out. Um, you can see the conductive skin sensor on his arm. And now his mother's helping him, and you can notice that because she's giving him this sense of confidence or helping him find the Legos fairly easily, um, his stress level stays a lot more regulated. So this is, this is what happens also when you look at um, extreme cases of behavior. So you can start to see those and then move it over into it's kind of a more of a mass step. Um, so we started to wonder if you can take these sort of conductive skin technologies and, and use them in a completely different way, and how, how will we regulate uh, if, our, if, if we have sensors that will actually tell us about our, emo our emotions, which we don't always understand, what will that mean? And what will we do with that data? Empathic threads are fibers that intuit your emotional state. Through contact with your skin, these special fibers gather all sorts of data. In this case, the shirt is a sensor for your body. Maybe you read the news and it makes you feel anxious, or a chat with a close friend leaves you feeling optimistic. The shirt helps you make sense of your emotions and allows you to share that data with people. <clears throat> but react. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess I need to put my psychologist on my speed dial. <laughs> um, I, <clears throat> well, you know, it, there's something about uh, the relationship between uh, uh, the things we make and the meaning we make that's that's pretty important and uh, you know I, I I have a lot of respect for those people that seem to be able to edit their lives down to have only the things around them that are meaningful mm -hmm. I don't manage to do that I have piles and piles of stuff around me and occasionally I find the meaningful things but um, but I think I think we are becoming more and more conscious in a sort of if we want to call it post-consumer society, whatever you want to call it, we're, more, we're becoming more and more conscious that, it, that we have choices to make about what we put around us, and that making choices is actually uh, about that is a, is, a, is a kind of healthy and rewarding thing to do, and that the, and that the more meaningful uh, the environment is that we create, the, 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 the better. So it's sort of interesting to, to think that we might actually start to have intuitions about ourselves, or insights, I should say, about ourselves that we couldn't have before. That, that technology might actually allow us to recognize in ourselves something that we were not able to recognize before, and essentially allow us to curate and, des curate and design our lives in, in ways that we haven't been able to do in the, in the past. Mm -hmm. and I, I sort of feel like, um, <clears throat> for most of us, uh, going through life in terms of the things we have around us is sort of a, is a series of of accidents, uh, and that and that becoming more intentional about it uh, is 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 quite an interesting thing. But but right now, the information we're getting from these sensors is not awfully useful, right? I mean, I right. I, I got bored with how many steps I walk every day quite quickly after I started wearing one of these things, um, <clears throat> and and I got over the fact that I was never actually doing enough, right. and just got used to it and just ignore it, you know. Um, uh, uh, but it but it's but it's quite interesting if you could imagine. You know, if I, if, I, if I have a sense of self in any, at any given moment, that, that, or if it's possible for me to get a sense of how I really am and really feel. Now, of course, many would argue if you work hard enough at meditation and other such things, you should be able to figure that out without needing technology. But, but I think it would be helpful. So, so I'm, I'm going to make fun of consciousness again. Um, because I think the, the idea of figuring it out may be the problem. The problem. Because, so there's an interesting study about um, um, deception. So, so for instance, if you listen, if you play voices to people, some of the voices being their own, some of the voices being other people, depending on their confidence level, secure, insecure, they will attribute the voices of themselves to other people or vice versa. And so you, you get it wrong. But if you are measuring their galvanic skin response, your subconscious always knows wow. when it's actually your voice. So you're 
you're deceiving yourself in order to manage your confidence level because confidence is a fitness function that you have to protect. And there are so many self-deceptions. I mean, and, and, and a lot of the work that doctors do with placebos or, or scaring people into taking tests that they wouldn't otherwise take. And there's a huge moral debate raging about whether the ends justify the means in deceiving somebody because most people can know things, but they justify them or they rationalize them. And, and so much of our brain is about this little tiny robot that isn't very smart, that goes around trying to plan all this stuff in not a very efficient way. And a lot of times our subconscious is protecting ourselves from the truth. So one of the, the interesting things is when you start measuring things like galvanic skin response, do you tell that part of the brain that's trying to figure it out or not? Is it immoral not to tell people? Is morality itself a self-deception? Does it even exist? I mean, so, so there's, there's a really interesting, raging, broad I mean, Like, the basketball was invented in Springfield, Massachusetts by a pastor P, um, PE teacher who was trying to get kids to stop beating themselves up in the winter because they didn't exercise. So he came up with a game that in freezing cold Massachusetts, they would get completely tired out in, 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 in the winter. If you had told every single kid well, we're going to make you play this game so that you don't beat each other up. They wouldn't have played. Mm -hmm. But they made it into a competitive sport. Then the YMCA picked it up. But it was all a complete deception in order to socially control these kids. And it only worked because they didn't tell them, I think. So, so again, this is, I, I'm not going to make a, I'm not going to put my chips on either side right now. But, but, but what's interesting as you start to design sensors and interfaces is what part of the brain are you trying to talk to? Are you trying to let the person know how many steps they had? Or are you going to use the number of steps they had, took, and their galvanic skin response to change the food that's made available to them at the restaurant? I mean, because it, it, it could be. And maybe you're allowed to be part of the initial setting. But after that, maybe it only works if you don't actually know what's going on. I mean, that's, that's just sort of just an idea. Well, there's also the difference between what's useful in terms of collective behavior versus what's useful in mm -hmm. terms of individual behavior. Yep. I mean, in many ways, some of the most interesting insights come when tens of thousands of us are using these things and we get a notion of what collective behavior we have, mm -hmm. as useful as it is to the, to the individual. Um, and it, it, it also, it's interesting that if you, I mean, if we're self-deceiving all of our time through our consciousness, mm -hmm. then we, we can start to use these senses to challenge our self-deceptions, can't we? Right. But, but it's, it's interesting that <clears> just another, uh, just one more deception story. So it's because of the matrix, you know, everybody thinks, well, I would take the pill and no. Well, it turns out, if, if you take, if you show a video to people and half the people are lying, and you ask them who are the liars, you can't tell. But if you ask them who are the people who are thinking the hardest, you pick the liars. So we have the capability of picking liars, but we choose not to, or our brain chooses not to, because it's socially uncomfortable. If I say, didn't you like the food? And you say, um, I was full. I'm going to say, oh, OK, he was probably full. Because if I then believe that you didn't like the food, suddenly this the situation becomes uninteresting or less interesting, you degrade trust. So there's a, there is a social reason for us to deceive each other and believe our white lies because it makes this, the social fabric stay better. And, and, and it is weird because we're, we're, we're equipped to know much more of, of the truth, but we, we, ch we choose not to. So we need to understand our social selves better before we start we, imagining these technologies are going to be We do. Oh, and, and, and I think one thing I would I'd also say is that each generation of kids have different social behaviors in different communities. Mm. And I think that there's an interesting iteration that's happening. So, so we design tools, like, like I heard that somebody was saying, I won't say the name of the car company, but they're making electric vehicles, but they're gonna make an engine sound mm. because people are freaked out by cars that don't make engines. Well, that's not gonna be true for our kids, no. right? No. So, so, so I think a lot of the tools are behind because yeah. we have sort of before internet people designing tools for ourselves. Yeah. And, and then there's this thing, but I think, you know. Well, that was the whole argument for skeuomorphism, wasn't it? Was that there were lots of us who were uncomfortable with the new. Well, there were people who were uncomfortable with the new, but not so much anymore. Yeah. Now we're just uncomfortable with the quality of the design of the new, but that's different. <laughs> cool, cool. So we'll move into to our last one, which is how, how do we think about this sort of making as you, as you move to scale? And we have, we have actually quite a few videos from things happening around MIT. Um, but it, it's sort of rethinking manufacture and the, 
there is a ripple effect that happens as you start to be able to make things differently. Uh, where you make them, the cultures that you create around the manufacturer, how people can start to participate. Right now, everything's, we're locked out of it in a lot of ways because it happens um, somewhere usually overseas in a factory or a plant. So that limits the amount of uh, customization you can have for better or worse. Um, you know, you don't have, you can't play a part in the process and it also kind of shifts how the economies work. So as you start to rethink some of these things, um, it, it shifts the communities and all the economics around it. So the first one is the idea of, of starting to program information into the objects that we make. So Skylar Tibbetts um, at the MIT Self-Assembly Lab, he talks about uh, 4, uh, 4D objects, the fourth dimension being information. What you have here, um, he's 3D printed this, this object, and as it's exposed to water, it has information in it so it knows to close on itself. So it's actually self-assembling. Um, and it's this idea that as you make things, even in smaller components, you can program information in it that it can make it more powerful, it can, you can change the way you think about assembly. So this is in an early phase, but um, you can imagine it blowing out. Then shuffle down the hall, literally to the center of bits and atoms, um, where Kenny Chung and Matt Carney and Sam Kalish are working with Neil Gersenfeld to think about how you can make really big things from things that are really small. And so what, what you see here is an assembly device that is actually taking prefabricated um, you know, struts and it's laying out to create something that might look like an airplane wing. So this wing is completely, um, manuf the components are manufactured somewhere else and then assembled on site. But I mean, you know, uh, wings are quite strong, they're quite large, you know, there's a lot of engineering that goes into it, but it changes the way you have to have your, your fabrication plants. And uh, Matt Carney did the assembler and Sam Kalish did the wing, I'm just gonna say that. Um, and then in, in the media lab, so Neri Oxman, which we have a couple of examples, she's thinking about what happens when you start to 3D print really big things. So when you have a 3D printer, you have a tray where things are laid down, it's called a gantry. So what happens when you wanna make something that's bigger than the gantry? Well, she's exploring this by creating a structure that hangs over the object and actually will use cables and sort of extrusion devices to place matter where you want it in virtual space. And it's beautiful, she's working on an art exhibit now that actually the extrusion devices are lit by LED lamps and they, they slowly place things. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a design exploration as much as it is sort of a, a fabrication exploration. We'll let it play through. But again, now, depending on how you can create the scaffolding above it, you can create, I mean, uh, theoretically, you know, anything as big as you, as you want, as big as the, you know, the, the physics will allow. Um, and then, then there's the idea of can you, can you make with nature? So this is even further out, but um, what they've done is at the silk pavilion, which actually hanging in the lab, um, they, took a, they took a silkworm, they put a, a small magnet on its head, and they used sensors to see how it would move through three-dimensional space. Then they calculated, or they sort of modeled this to understand how you would create a cocoon if you were a silkworm, and decided that they wanted to express this in physical space. So you're seeing these, um, these panels being assembled, and there's strings to hold the worms. And then they release, I can't remember the number, like 3,000 silkworms on it to actually weave the pavilion. It's beautiful. And it asks some questions that could you, could you create half of something and have nature finish it because you understand the properties by which nature acts? Um, it, it starts to wonder, you know, how do we think about fabrication overall? So, you know, it's kind of hard to follow all that science, but we'll take a shot. Um, <laughs> but, but this is actually a concept that, that Tim developed when he helped us design uh, for these concepts. There are a lot of places around the world where neighborhoods are going up fast. Well, what if the furnishings and trimmings could be made on site? CNC mills, laser cutters, printers, mobile manufacturing. Products could be designed to accommodate floor plans. And the system could efficiently scale and design for one or three or five people. This isn't a static system. People's ideas matter and customization is encouraged. So the basic parts are produced in the mobile manufacturing units but local artisans are there to put the human touch on things to complete the process. A little guy at the end waving the sword's kind of fun. But so there's a, there's a there's a micro question, so how this impacts our lives and how will we participate? And then there's a macro question of you know how this creates communities and economies. 
I don't know if you guys have any thoughts. Well, um, I guess the thing that, I mean, there's a lot of ground we, we should cover on uh, from, from those different videos. But the, the, um, the thing that I was thinking about when we started to play around with that trailer town idea was that um, uh, you know, we're shifting from the idea of manufacturing as either being at scale uh, in places like China with lots of capital where you pump in raw materials and, and, and raw knowledge and out comes container loads of products that get shipped to various markets around the world, or it's very small scale and it's craft base uh, and it's local, to something that makes use of both. And, and, that, uh, and we're already seeing you know, evidence of it. And there are already businesses um, beginning to kind of exploit this idea that, that large scale industry does what large scale industry is really good at, which is the which are the sort of underlying um, structures of the system, if you like, the, 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 the platforms on which we can create the, those final localized experiences. And it's those platforms that, again, that, that might then get shipped around the world and then get, literally get expressed locally. So the trailer town idea was literally that maybe you we would see these sort of roving caravans of craftspeople and technology moving from place to place, finishing experiences for people at a local level. But, you know, the IKEA kitchen cabinet carcasses will still be getting shipped in from Sweden or Indonesia or wherever it is they get they they they, they get made and and the you know the 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 platforms the digital platforms the electronics still be getting shipped in from China but the but the local the localized experience would be would be would be manufactured locally using some of these kinds of uh, some of these kinds of technologies at any scale I mean that's what's exciting about some of the technology that's been explored at the lab now is that we could, instead of thinking about this localized production only being at this scale, which is what 3D, the way we think about 3D printers today, when we start to think about fabrication or we start to think about these large scale uh, 3D printers, we can imagine uh, making things at pretty much any, any scale that, we're, that we would be interested mm -hmm. in as, as, as humans. So I, I'm, I'm sort of interested in this idea that, that, the, that we're shifting the basic infrastructure of manufacturing to be one of both being distributed and centralized uh, you know local and global and that we and that we and, the, and that in, you know instead of you know I, I, instead of the sort of the sort of mythology which I think is around right now is that the maker movement somehow replaces large-scale you know global manufacturing I, I think it's about bringing the two things together in interesting ways uh, and, and, and and that that creates all kinds of exciting opportunities for new kinds of jobs, new kinds of economies. Uh, you know, I mean, it's fun to see what people like the local motors guys are doing with their, you know, localized factories to build cars that are crowds, that, they, that they design through crowdsourcing. Yet still, most of those components are being shipped from the big suppliers in, you know, in various parts of the world. So it's that kind of mashing together of the two systems that I think is interesting. I, I think that's right. And I think if you look at the videos, there's a couple of trends. You know, T Tim just talked about at scale. So those little assembly things that they work on at the Center for Bits and Atoms, they're thinking about robots assembling nanoscale things and computer chips all the way up to airplane fuselages. And, and Neil has a very interesting sort of theory, which is that 3D printing is just an interim solution because it's analog and it's messy. And that assembly, kind of like with Legos, it's, it's, it's error correcting. And so the idea of creating, so, so that, that airplane fuselage is these interlocking carbon fiber parts. Um, it's lighter and stronger than just about any airplane fuselage that you can make. But it's, it's all one process. You know? and, it just, and then if something breaks, you disassemble and reassemble it. And, 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 the, and the idea that you have, and so if you think that there's only one standardized part to make a whole plane, the factory is very different. It's just a bunch of robots. You could do it in, in a warehouse, you know, and, and you could do it at the airport. And so, 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 so the, the assembly as, as the next step after analog, which is sort of going from analog to digital is 3D printing to assembly, that's, that's one idea there. The, the other part is a biology idea. So, so if you go to the nanoscale, you've got, um, I think it's called Solona. It's, it's, it's the, uh, the microbe designed by DuPont that creates polyester at 30% higher efficiency than the petroleum method. Wow. And you are now creating all kinds of chemical factories using bacteria. 
And then at, at, the, at the next level up, you know, you, you, you have the idea of things like the silkworms and, and, and but, but we're, we're, we, with genetic engineering, George Church, who's recently um, taking a position at the Media Lab as well, I mean, they're working on genetically engineering larger things. So chair, house, city, you should be able to plant it and grow it. So the most popular class at MIT is called How to Make Almost Anything. Yeah. Well, so I, I want to make the next one, How to Grow Almost Anything. But George Church is saying that, that, that bioengineering is going at six times Moore's law in terms of the, the speed at which it's becoming more efficient, generally speaking. So, so he thinks, so there's computational devices now that you can make out of uh, biology. You can actually use the genes for memory, and you can create computational devices, and they're getting faster. Already, a chromosome can store information more densely than hard disks. So, so he thinks that in our lifetime, we, we're not gonna be uploading brains to computers, we're gonna be using biology to do computation. So, so the role of biology in manufacturing, computation, and sensors, I think is gonna happen because you are seeing a huge drop in the, the cost and the, and the ability to do very complex things. And so I still remember, and sorry, I'm gonna ranting a little bit, but I remember when we, like, I think it was like here, probably a couple decades ago, you know, we talked about internet, and all these people said, nah, I don't, I'm, I, I'm not into the internet thing. I don't need to learn about the internet. You know, and, and today, everybody has to know something about the internet. Right. Same thing with bioengineering. Yeah, everyone said, I'm not into the bioengineering. I, I was like that until I got to the media lab. I don't, biology, that's too hard, I don't do that. No, we all have to learn something about bioengineering because it's gonna be in our face really soon. Um, and, and, and then, and then the, the, the last point, I think, um, is, is about design, and this is going to push this back into your place, is, that, you know, I think that, that, that your ability to contribute and participate in the design process changes significantly when you change the mode of manufacture. And we just sent a bunch of students to Shenzhen last year, and they sat in the factories and started hacking in the factories. And what the kids in Shenzhen do is they make cell phones on these factory lines and they make thousands of them. They don't make prototypes, they make thousands of them, go downstairs and then they sell them in the stalls and they copy each other's stuff and they go up and make an edit and they go and make some more. And exactly. every week they have a new model of cell phone and they're A-B testing. Right. It's agile software development for hardware. Yeah. And you can only do that when you're hacking on the manufacturing equipment. Turns out you can do that in Shenzhen, but now you can go online. Lamore Fried from Adafruit, one of our graduates, she bought one of these um, Samsung Techwin pick and place machines, a couple hundred thousand bucks. It's a factory in a box. It used to be a whole, it, it can put together electronics faster and more accurately than a, a whole factory full of people. So, so of course you can go to Shenzhen and do it, but now these tools, it's kind of like Amazon Web Services. Samsung is now selling its manufacturing expertise and you can go and buy one and put it in your, in your loft. And so, so I think that that also is a really interesting yeah. thing because it's not, because the maker movement, I love it, but it is kind of crafts, it's kind of about customization and personalization, which is important. But when you can just buy one of these machines and you can crank out a, a, a thousand and then send them around and things like that, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, that's another level of, of interest. And, in, and, and it's interesting, it goes all the way back to how design education first got going, right? When, so design education largely started with the Bauhaus, early part of the 20th century, and that as an educational experience, which, uh, which actually is, uh, underlies most product design experience, uh, industrial design education today, was all about designing through making, right? So kids were taught, students were taught how to make furniture, how to go into a metal shop, how to, how to weave textiles, and they, were lear they learned to design by making. And, uh, and, and so what we're seeing now is that, and they, and they were the, you know, the most accessible forms of making of the time, and it was one of the, and the, and the problem of the Industrial Revolution is that it's been very difficult to design through making with mass, man, you know, forms of mass manufacturing. It's very hard to go and play in a factory. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the, the, so that we now have these means of making that allow tinkering, yep. that allow designing through making to happen again. Uh, I think it's really interesting. And, and, and I do think to get back to the very first thing about in, intuition and things, like they were showing, our students were showing me these factories where they're making, but they, you know, people are putting like um, soda bottles in to do the dampening. I mean, th whatever you need to do in order to get the thing to work, they do. And it's just literally just kind of rigged together. And, and, and they intuitively understand this stuff. And, and I think it's important that it's, it not be so linear and abstract. And I, I remember this story where some sound engineers went to a pipe organ um, 
artisan in, in Austria. And, and this person made the pipe organs for all over Europe. And they wanted to understand, like, what's the math that he uses? And, and, the, guy, and the guy said, well, what do you do? How do you figure out how long and how thick to make the pipes? And he goes, I go into the middle of the church, and I clap my hands. And then I come back, and I start working. And they said, but what do you mean? And, and, then, and then he says, yeah, I, like, you know, you just know. And they said, no, that can't be how you do it, you know, because you don't, you don't get multiple shots. And he goes, no, I just know. And, and they just couldn't get their head around the fact that this was a completely learning through doing thing that this person couldn't articulate. I'm sure there's math going on in somewhere, but it, it, but it wasn't ex, an expressible form of knowledge. And, and I think that so much of learning and so much of design is that, and it gets lost when you, you, you try to you know, scale it. And, and what's neat about this manufacturing is it's a democratization of this. And so not everybody has to do the same thing. Yeah. And you can, you can exercise this intuition. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the combined democratization of manufacturing or making and democratization of design and design tools is what's changing things fastest right now, it seems to me. Uh, it's interesting, you, you talked about biology, and, and we've started to bring biology into our work, and we've got biologists working at IDEO now. Um, uh, but it, it's, it, it's, it's interesting about you know, how do we find intuitive ways of tinkering with, with biology, because so much of it's different. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's so much of that's new, conceptually new. You know, to grow things, you have to wait, right? You have to start, it off, start a process off and see what happens. Um, it, it's, it, any thoughts about what being intuitive with biology is going to look like? I, th I think it's, it's it, when the cost is low enough that you can tinker. So like iGEM, which is the, it's like the robot cup of biology where you get kids that show up and I, the other day that there was a, and you know E. coli, it, it's what makes you, your intestines smell bad. So the, some kids came with E. coli that smell like bananas and winter mint, you know. And it's completely frivolous and silly, but they probably learned a lot doing that. And right now what you've got is you've got Gene Bank, which has, you know, 100 billion or, or trillion base pairs of open source gene information available. And the problem was printing the genes, putting them in the cell, and rebooting it was expensive. But now we've got technology coming out that makes editing super easy. It makes printing extremely accurate and very low cost. We're doing this as a spin out of, um, Joe Jacobson did it, the guy who created e-ink is working on the molecular machines. And so the ability to, soon we will have a printer at your house that you can say, print this gene, drop, make it smell like bananas, stick it in the cell and reboot it. Th that's gonna happen while we're still alive. It's scary a little bit because mm -hmm. I think that increases significantly the likelihood of an extinction event accidentally happening. Mm. But um, <laughs> our, our extinction event. <laughs> yeah. Um, Whoops. And, um, and so I, I, I do know people who are making personal um, biospheres now um, because uh, we may need them. But so, so, the, so, 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 so it is scary, but to your point, I think you get the intuition by doing it, and also you, you, you learn about this, you learn about the risks by screwing up every once in a while, I think. So I think it's gonna be a little bit of learning through doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the point of learning through doing, is you do get to screw up. It's slightly scary when the technology has the implications it does. Yeah. I, one thing I was thinking about when you were talking about um, this shift between um, uh, what if, uh, kind of squirting stuff and fabrication, that that's an important Mm -hmm. change and I, the, the, the analog that uh, certainly when we were doing that work on the made in the future work that we kept coming back to that existed and has existed for a long time are things like knitting. Mm -hmm. Knitting is actually a form of fabrication yeah. but it's a sort of a biological form of fabrication in a way right yeah. and, it's, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, that seems like that might be an interesting uh, uh, sort of bridge mm -hmm. technology between the idea of, 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 of making in traditional ways and and, fab and fabrication. And, and knitting is another one where the math to describe knitting is really hard. You, you, you know? could never learn to knit if you did it by trying to le learn the math first. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, uh, at least uh, I, I, I tried to learn to knit and it was, it was hard enough even <laughs> doing it by the good old learning by doing method. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. Cool, cool. So now it's time to take questions from you. <laughs> Very, very interesting and obviously very stimulating point for us all, especially when you look at the, the movement that has been now positioning essentially the ability of taking an idea, a prototype, put it on Kickstarter, and all of a sudden you have enough money to turn it into a product. There's a byproduct of that passage, which I think is where everything falls down as we see things that have been on Kickstarter for three and a half years and they still haven't actually made it out. 
I was wondering what is your point of view on uh, the real shift that will happen in between those two spaces? Um, not just the rapid uh, prototyping, but also the rapid um, reimagination of a production line. Well, I think, I mean, I think Kickstarter and, and, and things like Kickstarter are actually a really important part of the democratization of making and the democratization of design because they make the funding part accessible to, uh, to people. They allow people to design something and then test, in, test it in the market by actually raising money for it, which is a great way of testing and design. Um, uh, the, the failure mode has been because uh, a lot of folks, including designers very often, don't quite understand how complex it's going to be to implement, execute the thing that they've, that, that, that they've uh, uh, that they've imagined. What I, what I expect to have, well, what is already happening, in fact, and what I expect to proliferate is that people are figuring out that there's an opportunity there, right? There's an opportunity to help the people that come up with these ideas figure out how to execute them. So there are little businesses beginning to emerge, in some cases some quite big businesses, that are providing services to help people who succeed on Kickstarter go make the thing that they've, uh, that they've, that, that, that they've designed. And so um, I expect, uh, I expect those, th those things to proliferate and help, and help kind of start to uh, increase the level of knowledge that there is out in the world about how you ha how you actually go and make things, uh, and and then and, you know then and then there are sites like Etsy which I think also play an important role mm -hmm. because they make the marketing of things so much easier and the, and, the, and these design libraries that are appearing from the 3D uh, printing companies now are going to be really important uh, and you can think almost think of those as an extension of that iteration table that we were showing earlier that that there are lots of choices already out in the world that you can sort of grab and add to what you're doing the sort of notion of them, you know, the mashup, which has become so important in music and so important in, in film and in video, is also going to be important in design. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think we're very early days, and it reminds me of when, you know, it, you really needed to understand machine language in order to run a server. To today, you can download Ruby on Rails and have a website running in five minutes. And, and I think that you know, that's why I'm sending students to Shenzhen. Mm -hmm. There are lots of accelerators starting up that are focused on hardware all over the place. Um, the factories in Shenzhen are creating interfaces for, for, uh, for venture companies just to address this model. And, and, and the successful ones are successful. I mean, one of our companies, Formlabs, they, they, they did a successful Kickstarter. They shipped all the stuff, and it helps so much in, in um, getting the money first and um, orders first before you had to raise um, a lot of venture capital. Yeah. So, so that, I, I, but, but, but I think also there, there is a continuum of like making one for yourself to going into full manufacture to sort of everything in between. And I think each one has a slightly different um, characteristic and, um, and they're all right. growing. But it used, to, it used to be, you know, when I started as an industrial, industrial designer, that continuum was a series of very big steps, yeah. right? It was one, then maybe it was five or 10, which cost an absolute fortune. Then you pretty much had to go to thousands. There was nothing in between. You had to go to start using real tooling, and and that those steps are getting flattened out. I mean, there there are, there are, the, the, it is possible to, to kind of choose where you want to be on that spectrum yep. uh, in a much more much smoother way than it than it used to be. It reminds me a lot of printing, yeah. like paper, yeah. you know, laser printer, printer service, books. You just have this sort of fairly smooth scale. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Hi guys. Um, my question comes back to a, ma a comment you actually made earlier, Tim, around uh, flow, which you were talking about around uh, the iteration table. And I guess a lot of the discussion today has spoken about these kind of rapid evolutions in technology and, you know, the possibility of extinction was raised in, I guess, the potential error that could arise on someone's ch cheeky experimentation. I guess my question to both of you guys is what infrastructure exists around, I guess, considering the impacts that things will have on humans psychologically and, and socially, the rate things are going for both IDEO and yeah, Media Lab? Um, I, 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 I don't know if this maybe is a really trivial answer to that question, but uh, it seems to me the best infrastructure we have is the level of interconnectivity we have. In other words, the ability we have to discuss, share, criticize uh, ideas, uh, when they're still very new, right? And we can learn because we learn about things so fast today. Um, we can we can have a conversation about them before they get very far, in a way that was not possible pre-internet, right? And so, the internet is both uh, enabling many of these these ideas and technologies to to, to 
to, uh, to happen, but it's also allowing us to discuss them and, and share them and criticize them. So I, I, I would say that's the best infrastructure we have for avoiding mistakes that are too huge and too disastrous, but you may have better ideas than that. This is slightly theoretical, but I, I, I think when, from the perspective of the lab, we're trying to create a very different design process. So in, historically, science and technology has been about creating something that gives you local gain at the cost of the system. And since the system, nature, was so vast and we were so weak, you didn't notice that you were depleting the system. And in fact, most complex systems are resilient, so it kind of healed itself. We've gotten to the point where we are now powerful enough to destroy the system. So now you have to think in terms of systems. And Twitter, which you know, I was an early investor, I love the company, but I remember people criticized it a lot and said, this isn't a company, it's a feature. Well, you know, it turns out when you're a system, and you're humble, and you work, and you connect everybody, it's a fine thing to be. And so I think if you become more humble, and you think in systems, and you think about the impact, you can't, and this is an internet philosophy, you can't know the whole of it, um, and you can't anticipate the effects on a complex system, but what you can do is try to be responsible, try to be connected, and I think the key to re resilience is diversity. Yep. So what you want is the internet has certain protocols, but what you try to do is create a lot of diversity in the layers between the protocols, because then extinction events are less likely. So at a very biological level, what we're doing at the Media Lab is we're, we're actually creating life that doesn't use the same amino acids anymore. It uses a different code. So none, no existing viruses work on this anymore because it's using a completely different set of code than any form of life on Earth. And so we're trying to, we can create diversity at that layer. Um, it's, you know, there's, so, so, so I think the bad thing, whether you're talking about philanthropy or whether you're talking about companies, I think the bad thing is when you get these huge dominant players that, that make everybody so similar that the extinction yep. event becomes more likely. And you can't avoid problems. What you do is you try to become resilient to problems. And I think the way that, that that's another design process is trying to build these walls that prevent you from, like firewalls are, right. you know, some people argue it's the worst thing that ever happened because it made everybody on the inside of the firewall not think about security anymore. <laughs> so you have this thin layer and then suddenly you're, you're exposed when everybody should have different um, security protocols and there's certain diversity so you get, one part gets infected but the whole thing doesn't blow up. So, so I think, you know, to me it's diversity, systems thinking, yeah. and, 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 and a level of responsibility that knowing that local gain at the expense of the system is, 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 not, is not okay. Yeah, no, that's, that, that makes a ton of sense. And, I mean, we are, get, I think, design designers at, uh, are, 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 I mean, places like with you and with others are getting better at thinking in terms of systems. As long as we don't think we can design the whole system or control that's the right. system. That's right, otherwise you become the, the Soviet Union. Well, there, yeah, and, there, and then that, that's a tough mindset shift for a, lot, for, a lot of, for a lot of designers, is that we have, I mean, I talk about this, 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 this shift in mindset from being sort of Newtonian in the way that we think as designers to being Darwinian. And mm -hmm. that really reflects going from kind of top-down, um, kind of architecture-oriented mm -hmm. to being kind of bottom-up systems-oriented. Uh, and that's a, that's a difficult uh, transition for many designers to go through because they've been trained to think about things that are about as complex as this, which they believe they can understand everything about, even though it, actually it's quite hard to even understand everything about this. Hi, my name's Kaz Brescher. Um, I work for Curious Catalyst, which is an agency bringing agile innovation approaches to entrenched urban challenges. And you guys are so talking about my wheelhouse in that... Um, Given that both IDEO and MIT Lab and all of us here are rather in a rarefied space as compared to the large majority of megacities that are bubbling and burgeoning and what we're going to see coming out of the developing world, I'm curious if you have examples of where these processes, whether it's agile assembly or bottom down, top, top down, bottom up, kind of peers incorporated stuff are catching on. Where have you seen examples of this working towards positive impact? in the large megacities. And talk about so we, we did an experiment recently actually with IDEO where we went to Detroit. And actually Shaka's here, um, he's one of our fellows. Um, he got out of jail about, prison about three years ago. He was in prison for 19 years and he led our team. 
and we worked in um, some of the toughest neighborhoods in Detroit, and we did design. And we brought students and faculty and, and people from companies, but we were really there to learn. And we learned more in Detroit than we learned, um, than a lot of things that we could ever learn in, 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 in Cambridge. But what was really, really fascinating for us was how quickly we spent, we, we went a few times, but over a period of about four days, how quickly people figured it out. And, and you know, there was, there was this young kid who was sitting there and said, I was sitting next to an MIT kid and my idea won. Mm. I want to become a designer. <laughs> you know, and then I had MIT kids saying, you know, we could never have figured out what the problem was, let alone design this sitting back in Cambridge because you have all kinds of constraints here and it's so interesting because this feels like working in the real world and not on some sort of academic pro project. And, and, it was, it, and for us, it was a big success. And we, we just did one in, in, in the Middle East. We're going to do one in Nairobi. And, and for me, it's fascinating because um, you know, like, because like, these kids in Shenzhen are designing twelve-dollar phones, and they're selling them in, in in Egypt and the favelas in Rio. And there's this whole economy of frugal reality that's going on that's so different from what we're learning in schools. And so, in addition to teaching, you know, our students how to really manufacture. The other part is how do you design in the field yeah. together with the people yeah. who actually care about it? You know, yeah. it's a, I, mean, I mean, it's it's. I think that's. You know, if we, if we think about what the you know, design process looked like just a few years ago, even the most human-centered design process tend to be one where you'd go out into the field, you'd do lots of looking hard and observation and meeting people and taking lots of video and all this stuff. Then you go back and then you kind of synthesize all of this stuff and you start to make things. And then you take those things you'd made back out, hopefully, and test them. And often, mostly they didn't work very well. Um, and then you learned, you came back. And it was a very long iterative cycle. And, and what we're doing now is we, all of that prototyping is going on out in, in, the, in the field. I mean, on our, we have a nonprofit um, uh, version of IDEO, IDEO.org, that's working almost complete, solely in Africa, South America, a little bit domestically, but uh, on poverty-related challenges. And the, the, the rapid prototyping they're doing in the field is, is remarkable. We've learned so much more from that than we would um, if we just stayed, stayed back home. In fact, they're often prototyping on day one of the project. When, as soon as they get out there, before they even start meeting people, they just go there, start making stuff with people because they learn more that way. And, uh, uh, and, and I mean, Joey's right. I mean, you, know, you, you get a much, you, you very quickly get a much deeper intuition about what the constraints really are, what the opportunities really are. You get collaborators who can take those ideas on and do something with them in the local, in the local context. It's, uh, it's, I think it's quite exciting. And I just wanted to add, add I forgot to say, we, we've been doing this in India for um, several years now, um, where we do a, a call for people who want to participate in these workshops with us, and we do long workshops. And we now, we have a lot of Indian students at the Media Lab, half of them come through this process where we discover them in the workshop, they get to know us, we get to know them, we fall in love with them, we invite them, they join the Media Lab, and then they're going back to India. And, 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 and so, so the Media Lab is turning into a network of people all over the world. And where we don't have people, we're going and launching these workshops to try to connect. And, th and to me, that this is so exciting because they're providing so much input to the lab. So it's not this thing where we're going and just giving. We're, 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 we're learning just as much as we're, we're, we're teaching. Yeah. Uh, hi, I've been listening to everything you're saying and the idea of you know, divergent thinking and how that's so important to creativity and then thinking about the future and, and the, the future you're painting. And one of the things that has occurred to me is that the other side of divergent thinking and that creativity process is the fact that many of us, all of us, are shaped by struggles. We're shaped by things that don't necessarily go the way we want. We learn by them. We become resilient, as you mentioned, and confident because of those things. And I'm just curious about how you see things, the, the, the features and functions and tools that you're talking about, potentially even applied to education. How do you see that helping to have the right struggle so that it's so that people still have to go through that process? I think this goes back to what uh, we were talking about a little earlier that Joey particularly was talking about, which is the m making, having to, the ability to go tinker and create something and take your idea and make it real in the world, realize that it's not quite how you thought it was, learn from the process of making it, is a version of that struggle that you're talking about. And that's what we've stripped out of the education system largely, right? We, 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 we teach it, it in an intellectual way, and then we test in an intellectual way. And the only struggle is, did I remember the facts, and, and what score did I get? There's no, there's no learning struggle that goes on. And, and, uh, and that's what m making 
things does. And so reintroducing into education forms of learning that are learning by doing rather than just learning by thinking, um, in, in my opinion anyway, is, 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 what, is what you might be talking about. Is what, um, and, uh, and I mean, the, the, trying to make the, make the idea come out of your head and be real in the world is one of the most intense struggles you can go through, right? I mean, it's in, incredibly frustrating, and, it, and, and sometimes you never get there, and you have to go back and start again. And, um, and I'd love many, many more kids to be much more confident about their ability to, 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 to do that, their ability to kind of, kind of head off into the fog, uh, confident that they're going to get to something interesting at the end. And I, I do think it's the personality in your, your brain. My, my, my sister was straight A, double PhD. I, I'm a three-time college dropout and never graduated undergraduate because some people are good with theory and some people are good at practice. You know, to me, learning by doing is not just making things. Learning by doing is, this is hot. Ow, right? If, 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 if you're a theory type person would believe that and remember, oh, that's hot. But you know, to me, that's just a theory, that's not a fact. If you touch it, you have a fact, right? And so for me, if you, if you do a startup and you, you, you pitch an idea and you screw up, you have a fact that that was the bad idea. But if somebody talks you out of it, all you've got there is a theory, and sometimes you have to pay for it. If it's a consultant, and you're going to pay a consultant a million dollars. Like, I had a company that I was trying to raise $600,000, and the company spent $3 million on a feasibility study not to invest $600,000. <laughs> so so, so to, to me, if the cost of the theory exceeds the cost of the failure of the practice, you should, might as well get a fact rather than a theory. And, and, and I think that, to me, that's... that's And, and again, your mileage will vary on this because, <laughs> because obviously there are, there are there, but, 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 but I think it's also like if you think about the immune system, if you protect your kids, and in Japan they usually protect the first kid but not the second kid, so the first, the Japanese second kid is always a lot healthier than the first kid because the first kid doesn't eat dirt. Um, the first kid, you know, the second kid, whatever, right? So, so they build an immune system. And the problem is when you protect somebody and you don't allow them to build an immune system, they, become, they don't become resilient. And so, so I, I do, I mean, it's a cliche to say failure is good, but, but actually failure is a really, really good way to learn, learn facts. And, and, and the tinkering is the same way. It, you, you, there's so much, like, theory, when you read a book about how to do stuff, there's so much theory, but when you actually try it, practice never follows theory. And, and conversely, a lot of times the theory doesn't explain the practice. I'd much rather have it pr work in practice than in, just in theory. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question. Oh, great. Um, I am Andy Forrest from Maker Kids, and we develop uh, maker education for kids. And my question is very related to the last one, and uh, that's just about uh, changing attitudes about education. And because we see a lot of parents that will come and ask us, uh, "Is Tommy doing it right? Is he doing a good job?" And I have to change each parent's attitude one by one that it's okay to fail. It's okay he did something crazy today that broke and didn't work. But how, how can we change society in general to, to um, accept that, that, that failure is okay and tinkering and exploring is, is a good way to learn things? Uh, Small question. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I mean there are, the most effective way I've seen it happen is when I see a high school, 14-year-old high school girl who just goes, goes back on a Saturday evening after spending all day uh, working on the robot for the uh, the school robot for the uh, Dean Kamen's robotics challenge goes back buzzing with excitement that she's just spent her first day ever in a work you know in a workshop at IDEO jumping up and down on a guillotine and r operating a lathe and 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 she goes back with like you know like her eyes are lit up and she can't wait to come back and do it again next weekend and her parents see that that's how we, I. Th yeah. That's the most effective way I've seen of doing it. I guess which means one family at a time, but it, take, it may take a while, but, but, it, but it works. And then, you get the, and then you get the parents calling me up five or six years later saying, hey, you know, my daughter ended up going to Stanford, getting an engineering degree because she didn't even realize engineering existed before she did that thing, and now she's off doing that. They're, they're the stories that change the world, I think. I think we, yeah, I, th I think we've forgotten how to make things, so we've forgotten how to be excited about making things, and being excited gives you faith that failing is okay and you can go on. 
Sorry, go, you were going to say we, something. We, we, we put a galvanic skin response sensor on a MIT student for a week. And if you look at the chart, you'll see that you know sleep, there's a little activity, labs, there's lots of, but it's, I mean, it's a somewhat proxy for brain activity. During lectures, it's more flat and lower activity <laughs> than, than even, even when the student is trying to relax. <laughs> So, so I mean that's that's pretty strong evidence that there isn't much going on during the lecture, because so 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 you know you kind of look at that and you, you've got to be you've got to be pretty weird to, if you think that there's 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 something going on. And so so I, I mean that I'm sort of joking but sort of serious in that, you know I, I think the, the the what I would say like John C. Brown calls talks about the power of pull which is with the network now, we have the ability to pull things when you need them. You don't need to read the encyclopedia from end to end because you might end up on the top of a mountain with only a number two pencil. You're always going to have the internet. You're always going to have your friends. You might as well learn the stuff as you need it rather than stock it and go. And I think the, the, the lecture process is really assuming that you're not going to be connected all the time. And when you're going to be connected all the time, what you need is passion and, and, and networks and, and the ability to learn and learning to learn. And I think the problem with our school system is it's focused on trying to train people to live in a world where you're not connected. Mm. Nice. Perfect. 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 Cool. Let's do it.